My name is Hidalmi Noriega, and I am Director of Community and Foundation Relations at the Poetry Foundation. It is my immense pleasure to be in this session moderating a conversation with Franny Choi and Dines Smith. Franny Choi is currently a Bolin Fellow at Williams College, and her most recent book is Soft Science, published by Alice James Books. Dines Smith is currently a Princeton Arts Fellow, and their most recent book is Homies, published by Grey Wolf Press. We'll start today's conversation with a poetry reading. Franny will read first, followed by Dines. Fantastic. Uh, hi, everybody. Franny Choi. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, this is a poem from my book, Soft Science, um, called You're So Paranoid. It's dedicated um, to a friend and comrade um, named Jose, who um, was deported in, um, I, I believe, in 2018. Mm. A wall of cops moves like a wall of water on a barge, no beauty. A wall of iron swallows the woman who falls to the ground and keeps falling. There's a video. The picture stays intact again. It's not pretty, meaning it's hard to watch. When a poet says we have to keep our eyes open, I know who he's talking to. I don't listen. I listen long enough to hate him. If I say the woman dragged by her hair, if I compare it, I witnessed, meaning stood by the window, meaning shuddered, let hand fall gently over lips, pulled coat tight, tighter. A wall of cops bucks like a frightened boar. If I describe it, will it speak? If I say it came furtive and dressed in red, the cops think cop thoughts, the cops move. They walk like a walk, like an economy, which after all is a fairy bucking with hunger, not pretty, not picture. I follow the border patrol agent through the airport, thinking fast thoughts, blood fast, bloodhound steps, he buys a burrito. If I, stay, if I say he stood alive in line and my friends are afraid to leave their bathrooms, my friends who I love and love and, my friends who eat from plates, who plug cords into machines for singing. If I say a wall of men standing on my friends' necks, if I describe it, my friends, who slice plums illegally on soccer fields, whose knees move like knees into the grass, if I name the grass, if I call sweet liquor and smoke, if I say cloy, if the child shrieks as she swung, if the sun, if August, if blue juice, will it talk? The cops are thinking cop thoughts. They move with a wall inside them, answering machines, answering. The window rattles and I fall to my real knees. If I hoist my friends up so they can be seen, by whom? If I say they are beautiful, if I compare, if the sun touches the glass and I feel it. I try to hear the border patrol agent order his food. I listen long enough, then walk to my gate. I feel ashamed and put it in my sleeve and later I make it a picture like everything. The wall moves like a fairy, like a woman through an airport, like a wall. If I say I watched the woman brought down by her hair and watched the woman cry and cried, if the storm skips my door again, if I leave to kill another goat, if I promise my crop, if I paint the wall up and down in sacred W's, if I make it any color, will someone put it in her mouth? If I close my eyes, imagine it, if I imagine it, if I think of something to say. The cop speaks and I call a plum into his mouth. It doesn't shut him up. The cop kneels in the grass below my friends, my friends, crowned with August and salt, my marigold, my wave. They laugh like a branch laughs. They make machines for singing. If I say a palm in the small of the back, if I say sun-warmed glass, if I say sunglass breaking open the gate. Thank you. Hmm. I Thank love you, that. Freddy. Damn, that was the poem. I don't want to do a poem. That was like the poem. That was a poem. Damn. Sure. You should have poem. You're so good. <laughs> you should have went second. Okay. Um, all right. Um, this is uh, from Don't Call Us Dead. Um, a note on Vaseline. Um, so it's about masturbation. 
Praise the wet music of frantic palms, plastic toilet cushion and shiny fingers, your eyes shut, rebuilding how Sherry bent over in math or how Latrell walked around after gym class, his underwear too small and brand new manhood undeniable. Praise the endless tub of grease. It's been the same empty, but not empty your whole life. This very same Vaseline you're using to polish your favorite body part was used by your mama to slick her face when Miss Latrell from over on Heg Street called her a frog-eyed bitch back in 76. The same grease your auntie used to make a disco ball of her small brown mouth when she decided to put it on Craig at the skating rink. This, fair, this same family-sized tub has been young with all your elders. It soothed grandpa's gout, grandma's fire burns and Saturday morning bruises is praise petroleum, how oily and blessed the space between your fingers, supple blade between index and thumb sends you to the guts of stars. Remember this grip when men use the stuff to prepare you for their want when they leave you thriving, tender, whistling from the wrong mouth, your bones replaced by yokes, you will never have enough spit and this is how men will want you always. Slug slime, slick of a man, twitching tunnel of left hands. Thank you, Danette. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. <laughs> I am so happy to start. Yeah. I'm so happy to start today's conversation with these two poems because the conversation is, of course, about a, a podcast, the versus podcast. But first and foremost, uh, your your public identity and your identity as creators, I think, is as poet, and um, that's that's you teach. That's how you live your life, or at least big aspects of your life, and that's how the world knows you. So, my first question is, why a podcast? Why why were you interested in in creating and and putting this out into the world? I think for me, um, I like podcasts as a genre. I've always loved radio. Um, I did, back in college, I had a show on the our college radio station. I was actually the station manager um, for a little mm. bit. Um, and even before that, I've always like, like just through car trips or just like, you know, just through morning stuff, I always had a high love for like radio DJs. And I remember the radio DJs and like, you felt like you know them, right? And like, it was also mm -hmm. part of the morning ritual, like listen to those DJs with my mom. And so um, there was a thing, right? Along with the music, you looked forward to Q-Bear talking. Um, and so I've always been attracted to that type of, you know, I think podcast is just the modern, you know, evolution of radio. Um, and so podcasts for me have always been so delicious as a consumer. Um, and when the opportunity popped up to have one, um, like I, I talked to Franny actually before we had verses about like, you know, I think like Franny also had interests and we had talked about like, oh, what we talk about together. And I think it was always this like, sort of like dream of like, you know, oh, like these are the people I love talking to. What would it be like to talk to them um, officially, you know, or with like technology mm -hmm. around? Um, and yeah, when the opportunity came up, um, it just sort of, it fell into place and it really made sense. And um, I don't know if some people would probably tell the versus story, but there was already kind of a sort of iteration that I had uh, with the Poetry Foundation that never saw the light of day. Um, and then we rolled back around and the second time around, um, Franny came on board and that's when it just like, I don't know, it just felt so easy. And I think that's what I always loved about um, radio shows too, is that it was just friends talking in the morning. And sometimes they had a guest. And so you were invited to show up to that too. And I think that's what we do with verses. It's like this thing, you know, that Franny and Denez are going to be there and they'll have somebody new over. Um, and that same sort of ritual, casual um, space, it also builds an integrity because of the integrity of like the mm -hmm. conversation and the love and everything. So yeah, so that's why a podcast, to like build a space that people can come to. And a space that I want to come to too. It talks about Fred and good poets. Yeah, I... I, I mean, all, all of that, all of that. Um, and also I think right before we had started um, working together on verses, um, I'd also just been starting to become more interested in 
like audio formats as well. Like I had just um, finished production on an audio book where I'd worked um, closely with my sister who'd done a lot of sort of like sound design elements um, to go behind to like work with some of the poems for my first book. And um, it made me just really super, like interested in the format. Um, um, yeah. And I was just like interested in like, particularly the things that, that one could do in, in that format, like as related to poetry, because it's such a, like the podcast and radio is, it's just like, it's such a, it's like a very intimate format in some ways. Right. It's like, somebody's like whispering a poem into your, into your ear, um, which is how I'd experience like recording this audiobook. I was like, I'm just like whispering into everyone's ear at the same time, um, which is which is like a sort of a strange thing. But I think that's kind of like you know what um, what we as poets also do. I think on that episode with Ilya Kaminsky, he said like um, a poet is somebody who speaks privately to many people at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's sort of like in some ways the spirit of our work with verses. Yeah. That what you both have both said resonates with me because when I think of verses, I obviously think poetry, but I also think community. You you two have built or have made to build community through this podcast. And I think at the center of that is your relationship with each other and kind of your deep love and deep trust and deep friendship. Uh, can you can you talk a little bit about um how your relationship long-standing relationship and love for each other before coming into this project um, influenced the development of the project and, and, and what versus and how you think of that when you invite a new poet into a conversation each time that there is a hmm. uh, For me, it's a very, like, the easiest way to answer that, I think, is, like, the Zodiac system, you know? I think, like, uh, mm -hmm. so I'm a Leo and Franny is an Aquarius, and those are Zodiac mm -hmm. opposites. Um, so we're like, you know, so we're like, you know, star sisters already. Um, and I think that for me, like, I've always loved Franny because I think like we are, our like weirds are very different, but we're also the same. And like, I see both a lot of myself in Franny and also a lot of who I want to be in Franny. <laughs> oh. Um, mm -hmm. and so I feel this natural, like, I think that's the thing about Zodiac opposites and also just our pressure that there is this like push and pull that is like this, like, you know, yeah, this attraction of similarity and dissimilarity and chaos and harmony and whatever. Um, and for me, that always worked with like my thought about like, I was like, oh, of course, like that would work in this podcast format because for me, I know it's a, been a pleasure to like grow into this with Franny and how we do this because I, I think our brains do work differently. And there are parts of the conversation that both of us are better at ways our brains move through a conversation that I am sort of, I'm just as excited to talk um, to our guests as I am to see sort of what Franny's going to bring to the conversation. Because I also know that that push and pull will also sway and move um, how how the episodes go. Um, and so I think, and so I think, you know, there, there is that, you know, we're like just similar enough, um, but both, and I also trust the ways that we're different um, to, to enrich conversations that we have. And I think that's the same thing in like friendship too. Like I trust the way that my friends are different and I need them to be that different for my own sake too. Um, that's why I love them. And also like, that's how we help each other. It's like, please bring your difference next to me. Um, so we can like both be a little bit better together. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. There's a reason why Bert and Ernie are best friends slash lovers, yeah. <laughs> depending on well, you know, in the, what your theories are but um yeah you know like they're yeah they're i think that we each bring like uh different ways of looking at the world and approaching conversations even um but also yeah i think that the, the piece of it that is that i want to kind of come back to from your question you me is this is like the the centering of community and like and love and friendship you know like that that i i think of our podcast as a project that's like at its core, a project of love, where it's like, it comes from the, the love of the two of us as um, as friends and like, like ride or die siblings um, who have a kinship with each other that has to do with poetry and it has to do with queerness and has to do with being people of color um, and it, many other things. Uh, and then 
you know, like a, the belief that from that love can come um, not just amazing conversations, but also like more love and more abundance, um, you know, I- extending to the larger community of poets and friends that we are a part of, the two of us, but yeah. also mm-hmm. beyond that, people who um, who we don't know that we've never met, you know. I think that one of the most like special things about, or the, the mo- one of the most special um, like moments um, in uh, our few years of recording verses was that episode where we had people um, uh, write poems to prompts um, that we gave mm. out and then and like sent in their audio recordings. This is a, uh, an episode that we did during um, kind of like at, during the first sort of like peak of um, the pandemic and the stay at home orders. Uh, and it was just sort of like it was it was beautiful to see to hear from people that we didn't know at all, that we've never met um, and to like be able to build that connection um, and to kind of like feel the love in the work that they sent in and in the questions that they sent in, et cetera. So, yeah. I think so much of what you do in your poems, but also in in your collaboration on verses with each other is centered on care. Like I think you care deeply about each other about your audiences, about people to invite into this work. And that's a thing I love and appreciate very much about this. Um, I agree 100% with Danette that this all came together the minute that Jenny joined. And, and until then, it was like, what is it going to be? We don't know how to do this. Um, so I'm wondering for both of you, what is the thing you wish you knew about podcasting and about getting into this project four years ago? Um, that you've learned since that it would have been really great to know that. Hmm. Um, you know, <laughs> I think that one thing that I wish that I'd known and I um, is or had um, been able to think more um, carefully and critically about was what it means actually to partner with an institution like the Poetry Foundation, um, you know, an institution that has a lot of power in um, the ecosystem of poetry um, and, you know, literary work and um, kind of the stakes of that and the responsibilities of, of that. You know, I think that um, the two of us, this, this is not really a question, an answer about podcasting exactly, but I think it's an, an answer about um, about what it means for people like me and Denez to take up positions that might not seem like exactly like their positions of power, um, but you know um, may become that or turn out to be that. Um, yeah, I think that it's, uh, I think that maybe I would have tapped like 20, 20 X year old version of me and um, said like, just like ask a few, ask a few questions of yourself and like what it is you hope to get out of this partnership um, before coming in because you'll make wider decisions all along the way. Hmm. But also so many yeah. lessons about podcasting. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. Um, did you want to say more? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was gonna have that. But, uh, cool, cool. Um, so I think yes. Yeah, so I want. So on that first point, yes. Um, everything, and yeah, I think it, it was a sort of moment to look at and think about. Like, I think like one thing I would ask myself or ask ourselves is. Um, uh as exciting as it was to like bring on like friends i think in a lot of those like early episodes right like um now that we are aligned with ourselves like what would it have looked like to just like because i think over time like and i think that's the thing about poetry is that it's hard to like avoid relationships within a community that is so kind of small and uh and i think at multiple levels from um from the sort of you know the i don't i don't know from like emergent um you know community local poets at open mics up to i think even the level that we're at where you're publishing and um doing all the things and definitely poet is it's definitely about community poets poets know each other um 
But I wish I think we, and I think we've done a, a good time, a good while as the show has gone on over the four seasons. Um, but maybe in the start, it would have been nice to like have some other folks that just weren't the homies. But that was also easy, who it was easy to get. Um, and also, I, we think, you know, I think that's the beautiful part I, about our show is that the homies are tight. And so I think we can bring um, a type of conversation with the people we know that um, is special. And, you know, it does, it's not necessarily better than the conversations that we have with people that we know less or um, who are meeting for the first time. Uh, but I love that we get both tenors of those conversations where we get to meet people in the studio and have that sort of discovery um, of, of people in their work together with the audience. Uh, and also to have these conversations with folks that we just know and love deeply as well. Um, but I think that can also, like, like Franny is saying, when positions of power and all that kind of stuff come into play and capital comes into play um, and how the Midwest capital shows up and not only just monetarily, but in terms of attention um and clout um yeah i think there would have been some things to just wade through softer um but also i think you know one thing we also uh did very actively i think after our second season was just start asking ourselves about how to be better question askers and be better interviewers uh because i think the thing that a podcast i think a lot of times podcasters find this is that it's easy to just jump in and have the conversation um but there is a sort of uh, a, a way to that. <laughs> um, and we had some help. Um, um, oh, God. Oh, remind me of the woman's name. I'm blanking at it right now. Um, Gen I want to shout Jennifer out. White. Jennifer White. Jennifer Sorry, thank White. You. Uh, yep. So Jennifer White came in and helped us um, in the session. And even it was a brief session, but God, it was wonderful. Um, and I think it really helped turn some things around just in helping get closer to what this... Um, what we want it to be, which is a space to bring these poets that we're interested in and that we love closer together with the people that love listening to these conversations. Um, yeah, and I feel I feel like a stronger podcast. I used to be very nervous uh, before every interview, and I feel stronger now. Yeah, I mean, and I, I also just want to like, you know, I, I totally hear that, Denez, but also like extend a little bit of compassion to ourselves too, that like in those early episodes when we were when we were mostly interviewing like the homies, as you say, like those, I think that's sort of like in many ways how our poetry careers, like that's the trajectory that they've taken that we've like always built for it with the people that we were closest to because mm -hmm. those were the people that were going to like, you know, be supporting us along the way. And, and, um, and uh, yeah, I know, I don't know. I think that there are, there are beautiful things about the ways that like the scarcity of resources in poetry, like create an intense reliance on community. And there's also like pitfalls to that. Um, and I think that it's important for us to recognize both the beauty and the dangerousness that come for sure, For sure, yeah. for sure. And also like a soft touch is like, nobody ever got rich, including us off of our <laughs> Like, you know, like, um, like a little grace. Yeah. Like, you know, like nobody, like, you know, versus is not, uh, the MacArthur. So, um, <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> I, one of the things that I think is exciting about working, working with both of you and, and of versus is exactly these questions that you've pointed to right now. Um, this has been a moment, this summer has been a moment that like, the country has been struggling with that. Like, what what does it mean to have access? What does it mean to have power? How do we build structure? Something that the Poetry Foundation has been struggling with this summer, in large part because poets like, including both of you, um, kind of called us to do that. And I think that things like verses also open a way to think of different relational positions and the ways that we can come at our work and our lives care and love and partnership and trust and all the things that we've been talking about during this conversation and that's something that I really appreciate you two modeling and and serving as an example. Um, be because we're talking poems and because we're talking podcasts, I, I want to address this question of as you try to bring a, an audience into the conversation, you two are like I said, accomplished poets. You all know a lot about what you do, but I know that a goal is also bringing a general audience that may not know all the things you know. 
So can you talk a little bit about both how you prepare for interview when you may know the guest work intimately and have very strong opinions about it, then how do you balance that with a desire for anyone who's interested in poetry but not, might not be as knowledgeable as you are to be able to gain from listening to this conversation? Hmm. Um, I think, uh, well, just in terms of pre preparation, um, I think you do the things, right? You read the work that's available. Um, you know, you read like sort of the most, like I always like scout my bookshelf for whatever book of theirs I have, or if I don't have it to, you know, head to the bookshop. Um, hit the internet, read their previous interviews and stuff you should do. And then that's where I start to look for like those little threads. Um, what was maybe the thing they said somewhere else that was interesting, you want to bring that back. Um, and we, uh, another thing that we do is we have a free interview, um, that we have every person kind of fill out because we really do want to talk to poets about what interests them. Um, and also it's a way for us to like, you know, we, sometimes we do know a lot about a poet's life. And so we want to ask them, Hey, what don't you want us to bring up in this space? Um, you know, what, what, cause that's something I think a lot of, as being artists that are interviewed sometimes too, sometimes you can kind of be blindsided by a question in an interview, um, and it just puts you in a super uncomfortable space. So we're trying to be tender to our poets in that way too, that they get to say, Hey, these are the things I would actually be really excited to talk about. Here's what it would actually take me out of the mood to talk if you brought it up. Um, and from there, we can also, um, you know, bring in our own curiosities and let the conversation that we have have its tangents too. Um, every episode is different. Sometimes I think we prepare a lot on, on, on one side and just the way the conversation happens, all that goes in the air. Um, and we really follow our poets and their, uh, their thoughts and their little weirdnesses and curiosities to, to the, to their end. Um, so yeah, so it's, 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 it's that thing. You kind of come prepared. And um, I think just the way conversation happens, you also come prepared to throw it out the window um, to be able to, like there's sometimes when we recorded an episode a couple of weeks ago where we, we didn't even ask our opening question. The poet read a poem and we were 30 minutes into talking before we asked what is supposedly our first question. Um, and that's just how it happens. So um yeah, and I think that's the thing. As, as long as you're preparing, I think you just allow your curiosity to be wet by the poet. And as long as you're doing that, then the conversation will happen just fine. Yeah. The only thing I'll add is that, you know, uh, in in response to the part of your question you told me about, um, about like bringing in a more general audience as well, um, like a non-poet audience. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that this is, this is um, a thing that, both Denez and I have been passionate about and have cared about for like uh, all of our entire the entirety of our our careers as poets and then also mm -hmm. as educators and as teaching artists um, is is making sure that poetry like the the wonders of poetry don't stay siloed in those who are just the most educated or have the most access to you know resources about poetry or or literature etc. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, you know, we, we we both like have straddled worlds, literary worlds that are very official and um, you know very ivory tower, and also have straddled uh, you, as well as worlds that are you know the worlds of like the poetry slam and the bar um, and the like mm -hmm. fifth grade classroom. And stuff. So um, that's something that we're we've always been thinking about, um, and we're happy to be able to do it in this format as well. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this conversation. I would love to close out again with your poem. Um, Dines, would you read first? And then we close out with Franny. And thank you all yeah, uh, for joining us today on the computer screen. <laughs> thank you. It's good to see everybody. It's also like, you know, like we have like talked to the three of us like in other formats too. So it's like, you know, like nice to talk to you in like these other people's house for a little bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I'm gonna read a super, super short one. Um, duh, duh, duh. Um, all right, um, I, this poem is nice because it's about one thing, but it's been been shared a lot on the internet lately as I wrote it about like my body and other people have been thinking about it as like the world. And um, it's, it, um, it's, it's, it's weird how poems translate meaning for people. Um, mm -hmm. so I like this one. 
Okay. Little prayer. Let ruin in here. Let him find honey where there was once a slaughter. Let him enter the lion's cage and find a field of lilacs. Let this be the healing. And if not, let it be. Pretty! Um, I'm going to... I'm going to read a different poem than I thought I would read. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Idelni, and thank you for, um, thank you, Dinez, and um, thanks everyone for having us um, and listening to us uh, in your living rooms or wherever you are. Protest Sounds 2020. The air is so thick with fury, it shakes the windows. Nothing cuts through walls like sound. No peace is a drill joy you have to charge to make work. The cheer that follows every threat, an ekphrastic poem for the as yet unbuilt museum of what we had to survive to make paradise from its ruins. It's okay if you don't believe me. No one could have told me I was possible with a sentence that would have made it true. So this isn't a sentence, it's a sound. It's a blade spinning. It's a wave that stutters at the air until the plate glass cracks. Thank you all. Thank you all very, very much.